I look forward to each and every interview. And this one, I must say, I'm looking forward to it even more. Uh, when I joined the club back in the mid-90s, there was talk about this bloke, and I've been looking forward to hearing from this bloke ever since. The talk was about a gun full forward, big bags of goals, jumping on blokes' heads, and commentating about himself during the play. This week, we're talking to Matt Dalton, or Dolts, who lit up Vic Park on numerous occasions. If they were doing entry fees back in Club 18 back in the day, people would have been shelling out their hard end to come and see this bloke play. So let's hear it. Straight for the man himself. Welcome to the series, Matt Dalton. And hello, thank you. Sorry I've been elusive for the last couple of months and stuff like that, but you finally got me. I'm not too sure if that opening was Matt Dalton or one of the other Dalton guys, but I'll take it. So thanks very much. Good well, to be here. Well, I was about to say, it's a, a bit of a different opening than I've gone with others in the past, but it, does it sound accurate though? Uh, look, you left a couple of things out that I could add towards the end of the interview, but other than that, I reckon it was okay and I'll take it. Well, guess what? You've got about 45 minutes to fill the gaps where I, what I've left out anyway. So so let's go to the start, Dogs. How did, how did it begin for you? Um, well, obviously I was a Xavier boy and then we all went into under-19s. I played under-19s at Zavs and Seniors for a couple of years. And then uh, sort of like I started a full-time job and stuff like that and training requirements were tough. Mm. So I sort of wasn't the best trainer, if I'm really honest. I thought training was a bit of a waste of time other than goalkeeping practice. So I uh, I had a lot of mates down at Q that tried to sway me over. So I think there was a, um, a Form 4 that happened. And uh, I think it was about a, a couple of cans of beer got me down there. And I came down, I think, 89, maybe 90 or something, just a couple of years down there. But uh, only it was two years, but it was a lot of fun. Two years, right. Okay. So... Full forward, though, we've talked about that. So was it part of your contract when you came across? You mentioned a couple of beers, but was the contract to say you had to play full forward? Um, I went to the forward pocket once. I journeyed over there outside the goal square. But, um, look, sometimes there was another bloke, Dave McIsaac, who was sort of centre-half forward. Occasionally we'd swap. Normally I'd say when the wind, we were kicking against the wind or something similar, I would go towards the centre or half forward and leave him down the back. But most of the time, I was in the in, in the GS, in the goal square. In the GS, very nice, very nice. Um, so, so were you always put forward prior to coming down? down to um, look, at school, I played uh, a little bit of back line. When I was younger, I probably played, believe it or not, in the centre or pivot. But, yes, mainly, mainly as a forward. Uh, I think under 19s, I was asked because I was a bit bigger and obviously more, um, I had steroid, heavy, heavy steroid use, obviously, when I was at school. So I was a bit more muscly than some of the other blokes. So I, I played centre half back in under 19s, but then moved down forward. And so that once you get a taste of a bit of blood and you get a taste of a few goals and stuff, it's pretty hard to go back to the back line. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. That's where the glory is. So um, I looked up the records and it had you as number 23. Now, Hugh Jumpers being Hawthorne Jumpers. Is that a coincidence or was that was that a sought out number? Look, I think he copied me, to be truth, truthful. I um look, I I put some stuff in my hair many years ago, I must admit, and uh, a bit of lemon juice in the hair and made it even curlier than the great man. And um I also did something that people don't realise. I used to change my boots at half time, right? So for those people old enough to know, Doom would come out in the second half in the yellow Adidas boots, right? So I think I started with the Pumas in quarters one and two and change them into the Adidas strikers, I think, for the second half. They weren't colourful back then. It was just yeah. the black ones. But I tried to model my game on him, right? So 23 was the only only Guernsey I really wanted at that particular stage, right? So, um, yeah, he was a very good person to um, to be a protege for. Oh, yeah. Good play, the boy. Good play. So uh, why not? Look, he was a star, right? And, and back in those days, right, he just commanded everything and uh, – he and the great man number 19, they rule the roost, right? So um, Dave McIsaac and I try to model ourselves on on one or two of those guys. One of us did it quite well. The other one probably struggled. You guys can work out who that was. <laughs> Very good. Um, so did you have the mullet as well? So you had the curly hair. Did you have the mullet? Oh, look, I didn't go the full mullet, right? But the hair was a little bit longer back then. I actually I actually was a school teaching at the time, right? So uh, I was a school teacher at Whitefriars College in Donvale. So I sort of had to let the hair go a little bit berserk on the Friday night and the Saturdays and then comb it and put the brill cream in it for, or Vaseline for, for Monday morning. So it was a little different hairstyles. <laughs> Very good. All right, so let's get into the playing career. How many games? How many goals? What do you reckon? What are you, what are you talking? Um, 
Well, if you've got the records, you can tell me. I think I kicked, I don't know, I think I kicked probably 70 and 50 or 70 and 60. I'm not too sure in my, in my two years at Q. Um, yeah. But I, I would have only, I think I only played the two seasons and, of course, the finals. So whatever that is, 40 games or something similar, I'm not too sure. But um, I, I played a lot of old Zabs. I played about 150, 170 games, I think, in old Zabs from under-19s through to Crocs and stuff like that. But just the two, the two fun years at Q that it was. Yeah, yeah, so it's a pretty good strike rate right? if you're talking 130 goals. Well, that is sort of 13, 15, probably 35 games. Good strike rate. Right? Yeah, I think they only played about 14 games or 15 yeah. games plus some finals. So, um, yeah, it's good. The, the guys, uh, they looked after me. Yeah, so your best season is about a 70 goal season. What's your biggest bag in a match? Um, oh, look, I used to be a maths teacher, so I won't talk about specifics, but there was a funny story to this, and I won't tell lots and lots of stories, but. Uh, uh, at the time, there's a guy from the Bloods who was a really good full forward. His name was Grant. I think his name wasn't Grant Thomas. It was someone, John Thomas or something. I'm not too sure, right? Probably, that yeah. sounds a bit like a porno name. But he was a very good player. And um, so he and I were always sort of seeing each other. And I don't think there were mobile phones, so I couldn't text how many we got. But we always checked the record. And so we were neck and neck all year on the goals. And I think he was like seven ahead of me when it came to the last game, Right. So I said to the blokes, listen, we're playing an absolute shithead team here. For the first time ever in your life, look after me, right? So it was a little bit like Dunstall and Fred Fanning back at the day at, uh, at Waverley. There were blokes running in at open goals, and then there was zeroing back and passing to me on the boundary, right? So wherever I went. So I think the long-winded answer your question, I'm not too sure, but I think I kicked something like 13-6 that day. 13-6? And the funny thing was that the other bloke didn't play. Oh, really? So I sort of thought 13 might just get him. I wasn't too sure, but he didn't play that game. So um, so I think it beat him by a couple, but that was probably... Oh, look, I had a couple of a couple of hauls of over 10, but that's, uh, but that was the one that I remember. Yeah, yeah. So um, so he knew about this little battle that you had going between you, you and John Thomas, I'm sure. He had yeah, look, look, you know, when you're playing this in, in that sort of era and stuff, you always have mates and stuff like that you know of, and you'd meet them at the pub on... Thursday night, and someone's kicked someone, and someone's playing, and you look to see who they played. And like anything, there were the powerhouse teams of the, of the, of the uh, competition, and there were the, maybe the ones that you really wanted to load up on, right? Yeah. So um, if I knew they were playing a top-four team, I would rest a bit easily. But uh, if you were playing a low-key team, it was just uh, a time to put a dozen away. Absolutely. Um, so as full forward, so you talked about the Dermy rather than the Dunster. Dunster was known for sharing around and handballing and tackling, shepherding. Let's go through how many shepherds you reckon you did in your career? Three. Handballs? Listen, a lot of people reckon I didn't handball, right? And can I, every time a goal was kicked, I would normally jump the fence and pick up my own ball and then hand handball it back to the boundary umpire who would then take it to the bloke to bounce the ball again. So if that was the case, I had a lot of hairballs, right? In play, I think I got tackled a couple of times and gave a few ones out. But um, but if you're executing the ones from back of the car park onwards, prodigious plenty, handballer. Plenty. Diesel. Like diesel, I suppose. It was. Uh, tackles on the back of that? Uh, I remember chipping over a bloke uh, and he had the ball and I grabbed him. I think I got he, I think he got paid holding the ball. So it was probably the one. <laughs> Lovely. Lovely. Show that he get a photo of it and frame it. Look, they used for some reason they used to call me Mr. One Percenter, but I'm just not too sure why, right? I wanted that nickname to grab some legs, but it, it never went anywhere for some strange reason. I don't know why. <laughs> Fantastic. So you came down with I think you came down with the McIsaacs. I think you came down with oh, they were the probably they were the people that bribed me to come down, I think. So um, you know, I went to school with with Rob and Dave and I knew Richard, et cetera, and some of those guys. They were a couple of years older than us at school. So, um, yeah, played with a lot of those blokes for a long years. And they were the guys that entered me, entered me in. Yep. Yeah, good one, good one. So I'm, I'm in discussion with their manager about uh, a combined interview, which is going to come up shortly, actually. So stay yep. tuned for that. Give us some insight before I do talk to those guys. Who was the best? I think the five brothers. Who was the best? McIsaac. Um, they were all very different, right? So there was, there was Rob who was a bit of a spring heel jack. He was always tank taking, trying to take hangers, but mm -hmm. the problem is the ball was never in the vicinity when he went to take the hanger, right? So he had a great leap, but I'm not too sure about whether he plucked any, right? So it's funny, if I if I had to try to give you the modern-day player for Rob, I'd probably say it was a Timmy O'Brien, 
right? Oh, from Hawthorne. Yeah. So he's 23. always up getting his hands there, but never quite clunks them, right? Is he so, number 23? Pardon? Is he number 23? He's number 23, but he's a redhead, right? And uh, he's not the same type of player at all, can I just let you know, right? And then there was Chris McIsaac. Chris was good, right? He had some good hands, actually, Chris. The problem is that I reckon his eyesight wasn't that good. And it was in the days, I think, before contact lenses. So I think he might have even been wearing the Jeff Blethens at one stage. Oh, so I think a couple of times the ball falcon Chris on the on the top of the head when he couldn't see where it was coming from. But he was actually a, a pretty solid player, Chris. And Dave, Dave McIsaac, well, I think not many people know, but Dave was one of the first decoys ever used in the Vaffa, right? Yeah. So we used to always say, Dave, take that bloke out there and give us a bit of space and stay out, stay out on the corner, right? And the Dave, would he... Uh, he, what we used to also do was um, sometimes people would read the VFA record and if, like, I kick seven or eight or something similar, we'd just say I kick three or four and give Dave three or four. So, oh. obviously, it wasn't triple teamed, as you know. Yeah. So, Dave got a lot of Joe the Goose goals, but he was a pretty good player. And then there was Richard. So, Richard was the skipper. He might have even been captain coach, I think, which is something that hasn't happened in the AFL for about 40 years. He was very passive-aggressive, Richard. Yeah. So um, I don't know what he's like with his oncology patients at the moment, but I reckon if they don't take their medicine, he's going to look up, he's going to go for them big time. But he was a very much, he ran in the ski slopes. He ran straight ahead, like a Calvin Moore type bloke he was. Yeah. Um, and then there was Andrew McIsaac, right? The, uh, the big doctor, right? So he had the orange hair and uh, he played just one game, right? And I think he, I think he might have been Cameron Mooney-like stats in the grand final. I don't oh. think he troubled. I don't think he troubled any handballs, any kicks, any goals, any marks. But there was something about Andrew. I don't know. He had a good read of the game. Like at halftime, he was reading encyclopedias, his medical journals and stuff like that, trying to catch up on stuff. But he could have been the best McIsaac, Andrew. But after after just the one game, I think he hang him up and he went into all things cardiovascular. So they're all different players. I don't want to be, it's like, which kids do you love the most, right? Mm. But I'll just say, even Angus McIsaac, who was, a cousin, who was a cousin, he actually wasn't one of the five boys, but he played a few games and he could play. Well, he, he would tell me he could play. But mm. uh, I'm going to say that Andrew was the best McIsaac after the one game. He could have been anything if he just stayed on the track a bit more. It's all about potential, isn't it? That could have That's been what, what could have been for the man. It is. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, um, yeah, so oh, that, that's good Good start. Good fodder for uh, next week's interview anyway for the boys to see how they respond. I can give you a list of a lot of questions to ask, Anth. Sure do, sure do. Chuck them through on an email and uh, you set it up because I think you've done the same for this interview too, which has been quite handy. Um, so I'm fascinated about you provided to, a lot of feedback which I received about you as I referred to the start was how you used to commentate during a game when the ball's sort of in, in play. So you're commentating yourself. So do you recall? So tell us about that, your commentary you would give. Uh, I have had that feedback when I listened to a few of your interviews and stuff like that. Maybe it was just I was reading the play, et cetera. But, um, like, I used to have a lot of commentary, especially with sometimes people in the crowd, right? So um, we used to play a, a team called the Bloods that I know that you've heard about before, right? And they were just... They were the Harlem Globetrotters of the competition, right? So you got these Bogans from Suburban Q playing against Bloods who were normally old Harleby blokes, right? And, like, their, ta their team was full of absolute superstars. So mm. like, James Rain was there mm. all the time, Dave Rain. Brad Robinson was there. Um, they had lots of players. They had um, Gary Sweet was playing at one stage for them, right? So – and they had – they had seriously a thousand people that would follow them. So we would have like a couple of guys, girlfriends that we met on the skinny dog the night before would come down, would come down to say hello to us. And the rest full on was a thousand people. And I don't know if you know that if the hit band, the Shantuzies, yeah, like yeah, Toddy yeah. Goldsmith, Ali Fowl, like absolute glamours. Yeah, David Ramos on drums. There you go. Absolute glamours. They were down to watch all the time. Oh, so we sussed this out and I think we might have... Um, we played a game very early on. It might have even been a practice match. And I think they might have just beaten us, right? And all of a sudden, there was a bit of R-E-S-P-E-C-T that was given in that game. So all of a sudden, we just said we set ourselves for that particular game. Now, I know you asked me a question about commentary. It's coming in in a second, right? Well, thank you, And that, those games were seriously, we should have sold 20 buck tickets, right? Because there were people everywhere. And high standard game, high caliber game. And we used to knock them off occasionally. And they didn't like it. Right. And and 
Well, story has it that the Shantuzis that were always up the blood's end, right, and that would change each time the blood's kicked, used to stay down the queue end. And occasionally when we would kick the other end, all the Shantuzis used to rock up. So I used to say hello to Ali and G'day Toddy and that sort of stuff. You know, I think Ali was going through a divorce on sons and daughters at the time, so it was awkward. I just double-checking she was okay. But um, <laughs> they were just fantastic days. And I used to do some stuff, a bit of commentary, um, especially on my opponent, right? So often I'd go down and say, just going to have a look at your back just to make sure I can see what I'm going to do and that sort of stuff and how tall are you and are you strong, can you hold me up and that sort of stuff. And they used to get a bit pissed off about that. But... Um, but it was normally, but the thing like Akamanis is you got to fold it up, right? You can't yeah. just have mouth. You've got to be able to walk the talk. So sometimes I did, sometimes there was egg in the face. But those games with the Bloods, I remember, I remember there was one day when I was just getting smashed. So you know that double teamed is a thing of the past. Triple teamed was what a new word invented because of me. You know that, Andy. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. there were three guys on me at one particular stage. And Ali Fowler and Toddy Goldsmith were like 10 feet away. And I thought to myself, okay, if ever I'm going to do anything in my life, now is the time. So, you know, when you go up sort of Gary Moorcroft-like and then you get propelled in? Oh, do, you, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, 100%. Okay, fine, so just double-checking because yeah. I had some feedback that you would not understand that. But still, that's fine. Up I went, bang, and took it right in front of her. And you know when I was in a position that was right on the boundary line? And if you look at the goals, you think the ball actually can't fit through the goals. There's just no daylight whatsoever. So I remember turned around and I screamed out to the umpire and I said, stay there, you're not going to move, right? And all of a sudden, there was a few people that started bloody giving me crap from the crowd, right? You better kick it, mate, and all that sort of stuff. And anyhow, legend has it. You can ask other guys what happened. But you know what? You know when you just know when you golf drive and just a bang yeah. straight from the screws? Well, just technique as I kicked it, bang, turned to the crowd. Didn't even watch, right? <laughs> so I, I, I do hope it went in because I, I went high five. <laughs> Toddy Goldsmith had five me and, and, and Ali Fowler high fouls me. I just hope the ball went through. I'm not too sure. But um, that was a bit of commentary and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. Like the, um, the umpires used to commentate as well, right? So we had a legendary umpire down there called Dave Winslow. Yeah, no, Dave. Yeah, Dave He's yeah. like the Frankie Pagano of the Vaffer, right? Yeah, yeah. And he... Um, he played a lot of time, right? I mean, and I was always smart enough to know, just check what umpires are playing and make sure you say, geez, you didn't been in the gym and stuff like that. You look good. And early on, you would know, oh, this bloke hates me. I'm going to get nothing. Or, okay, I'm in for a field day. So I used to say to Dave, Dave, that was a great decision about holding the ball. And at half time when we come in for the pep talk, I'd always go in and just check with the umpires and stuff. And, hey, you've penalised me a couple of times. You were totally correct on those. Well done and stuff like that. Towards the end of my time at Q, I probably wasn't as complimentary, but um, the umpires and Dave Winslow, we had a very good relationship. And sometimes he would say, no, nah, no, nah, and like I'd take six bites of a six bites of the ball, play on, play on. And I'm like, what the hell? And he goes, you got to share it around sometimes, Dolts. I've got to bring Mick O'Dane to the game. So I'm like, bloody hell. So he was the choreographer of some of the games. Oh, and, exactly. and he used to always do the Q games, and he used to line up for the – for the Bloods games and the St Bernard's games, the big ones, and he was a he was a great man to have on your side because I reckon out of that those seventy five goals, I reckon he probably gave me twenty. So yeah, yeah. So um, Mickey O'Day. So when I played, Dave Winlow would actually umpire our games as well. Mick would always do a collection because Dave's boy Tommy would do the boundary umpire, and he was eight or nine at the time. So Mick would do a collection amongst the boys, he'd give all your coins to Tommy. You know exactly why he's doing that, doesn't that? Don't you? Smart, right? Okay. Yeah, well, well, Mick wrote the playbook on that sort of stuff, right? As a matter of fact, you're talking about Smothers before, right? And I reckon Mick O'Day, and you said oh, I had about one or two Smothers in my life, Mick had about 30 Smothers, but they were on my kicks for goal, right? <laughs> so especially if I was in the goal square, you've got to take a quick snap, Mick could start smothering the ball, trying to keep it in play for him to get the bloody easy feed. It was incredible. I know, I know. He's and, he used to, and, and you talk about Mick O'Day, and he's, he, uh, he keeps telling me he's a legend of the Q Paran Footy Club or whatever it was called, but he was a good player, Mick, mm. and um, he used to love it when it was wet. He hated it when it was dry. He was one of those blokes that always got the oil and he put it on the ball beforehand, right, so that when you'd go for the one straight out in front, it would fly through and Mick would pick it up. <laughs> but he was uh, – I, I, he's like an Anglo-Saxon Eddie Betts, I reckon, yeah. is what Mick O'Day was, right? He was very elusive, kicked a lot of goals. But he used to, I used to get a bit peeved with him because he used to go up to my opponent and say, hey, mate, he always leads to the left, go out there. And he used to do stuff to be out here, but block me. 
Because every time he blocked me, he knew the ball would be on the ground and he'd be a chance of snagging one. So not many people know those stories about Mick, but I, I never forget. I know. That's that's why we have these series, just to make sure that the truth comes out eventually. Well, there's a lot of truth that will come out in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you as well. Yeah, good, good, good. So in terms of your commentary, coming back to that, is I've heard of some terminology, which we used to always hear when we heard about you as a player, and it was about um, hover time. Was that a phrase of yours? Hang or hover. Yeah, I would have used those words. Guilty as charged. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes it's not about where you take the ball, but it's how long you're actually off the ground and just hanging around. So, um, And at Q... Uh, when you look at Q, for some reason, we used to kick all our goals uphill, which to the person who was running it was to the right-hand side. It was probably the driest, right? So it was always on the Q cemetery side for the hang time. That's normally where it was. But you've got to be careful of the sun. Yeah, of course, of course. You've got to watch out for those things. Um, and I heard there was one time when you, the goal umpire, you've taken a mark and you've turned the goal umpire and said, start waving it, mate, before you even kick the ball. Uh can't remember the specific time, but I think I would have said it many times, right? You've got to also be good to the goal umpires. I know I gave Gabe Winslow a bit of a pump up, but sometimes when they're kicking the ball pretty quickly and, and those goalposts are pretty low, sometimes when it's up there, you've got to start the clapping and high five and pretty early, right? So um, uh, a couple of times, I used to say, mate, put the ski slots in. I see you just rock back most of the day. So... Um, uh, I actually thought I was going to be quite bashful and modest on this. You've brought out the worst of me here, Ed. But um, sometimes the goal umpires were very important as well. Yeah, no, they're very important, mate. They're, that's a key for you and your your success. But I've, I've heard a story about you took a hanger on a bloke one day and apparently you just got up and said to him, mate, you are the worst footballer I have ever seen and uh, stand back while I put watch me put this through. Watch and learn, young man. Um Ring a bell? Can't remember, but it sounds like what I used to say. Um, I think a couple of times I said, as I said, I'd check out his back and stuff and left-hand side, right-hand side, if he had a lean as to where I'd go up. And a couple of times I used to, like, pull me and belt the crap out of me and all that stuff, especially when the ball was a long time away, right? Mm. And they'd hold you, hold you back. And if Dave Winslow thought you'd kick two or three for the first half and he wasn't going to give you any more, you had to really earn them. And sometimes you do. Like, I'm a pretty unmoody bloke, right? But sometimes I'm like, I've had enough now. So I said this bloke, right, I'm going to absolutely stand on your head in a second, mate, when the ball comes down. So normally we'd go, I'm going to kill you. And he, he tried to punch, but I was up there. So he'd be punching me up like that, right? So at the time, there was a couple of times I said, you're going to be in the front page of the, at the Sunday Press or the Sunday Observer after that hover, mate. So um, um, it, it, I, I don't know word for word. I'll, I'll, I'll say I didn't say that, but it sounds like something I probably would have said, Your Honour. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. Um so and then so but then I heard a story also about the other team sent a dog in to attack you at some some point. Was it a strategic um, play? That is true. I reckon I'm the only bloke in Vaffa history that ever got his hamstring mauled by a bloody rock wheeler. Right. Oh. So and it was like this wasn't a fun thing. This was Port Colts. Right. Oh, so they played a yeah. keeps. So they had Buster Harlan and some of the gosses and like they had tough blokes playing there, right? And there was no behind-the-camera vision, believe it or not. I was lobbying for it big time, but they would never do it, right? Or maybe a Polaroid that someone would push occasionally, right? So they used to um, they used to really get enemy, and especially some of the poor folks. And if they thought you were play and they thought you were public school, of schoolboy, you were just fodder, right? So there was one time, I reckon it was just halfway through the third quarter, and we were beating them, and we were a little bit timid and scared if we were going to beat them. I'm like, hey, guys, at three quarters on, do we really want to beat these guys? Let's just give them the four points and get away. But at one stage, I think I was hanging back or I've just taken a hover or something similar, a hangout, as you would say. And all of a sudden, I get like this. And I feel this enormous pain. Like, like you know, when you talk to Rodney Fox who loses half his leg and bloody, you know, Alberton or something similar. I was like, this guy, this this dog is absolutely mauling me. And it was some bloke said, oh, sorry, mate. Yeah, get him, get him. He's a quick cue pufter. So, um, yeah, I reckon the only bloke, I had to go and get some bloody stitches in the back of my leg from a rock wheeler. They and had to bloody the tuberculosis or whatever it was. So um, the match. they used to do a lot of things to put you off, especially in the goal square at opposition clubs, right? So there was no one standing on the bloody side or the wings. They were always standing behind giving me crap. So, yes, that 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 is a true story. Wow, oi. Well, wow, that's that's got that, that'd be front page of the paper these days if you know that. As happens. I said, as I said, should have been on. Yeah, that's right. Man who should be on here for taking a hanger is Hang, on for hanger a hanger and rock wheeler is the greatest story. Like, don't worry about COVID. 
Die by our princess die. I reckon that hanger and COVID, hanger and hanger and a rot wheel would beat everything. <laughs> <laughs> so die about Trump stuff. That's a beats in. So I'm gonna do a bit of a bit of word association. This is something I did in some early early episodes, but I reckon it might work well for you because I like your your approach to these sort of things. So let's get I'm gonna name some players from back in the day and hopefully you play with some of these guys, but let's go through a fair few. First thing that comes to mind, it can be short, long, whatever you want, right? Mm-hmm. Let's start with Ditch Mac and Crow. Well, Johnny, his brother's one of my best mates, so I've got to do the right thing by him, but he was a good player, Ditch, right? So I used to call him One Punch was my nickname, right? Because he said to this bloke once, he said, it's only going to take one punch and you're going to be in the next week. So ever since that, I called him One Punch. He was a good, solid, I think he was centre half back for a couple of years at Q, played very well. If I had to give a modern day player for him, um, and I know he's a big Carlton supporter, so why am I going to go with Levi Casbolt? Right? Oh, so he would just crash packs. Right? He'd always be there, he'd be punching and fisting and stuff. He never would take many, but he'd always spill the boil, right? Ball. Um, he wasn't a forward, he was a defender, but he would be the modern day Levi Casbolt would be Ditch Matt and Great. Well, I reckon he I reckon he got best on in the um, ninety four premiership. I reckon Ditch. He's Matt a good player. He played for probably six or seven years. Yep. And uh, we would always thought he was one of the first picked and he was uh he had that angry ant about him, right? And he had that look in his eye sometimes, right? So the one punch factor. But he was a very good player. Very good. Adam Phelan. Who? <laughs> <laughs> He'll kill me. <laughs> um well, Adam, he was a stalwart. He was a long raking. Well, he told me he was a long raking left footer. I saw a lot of left foot balls go straight up in the air. Um, he caused me a lot of headaches, I reckon, Adam. He'd just kick them too high, right? But um, he was the heart and soul of the club, Adam. Good fun. If I had to think of what sort of player he was, I'd probably say he was a uh, – he's like a Barry Rollings type player from the from the, from the 80s, right? Number 22. So he had a bit of speed and stuff. His hands were okay. He had a bit of blonde hair. He wasn't yep. a school teacher, but he was a uh, he was a good left foot kick. So he was yeah he was a good player, Adam. Good one. And just ask him; he'll tell you how good he was. Yeah, yeah, and no, I heard him episode eight. I think he was on, so we, we had that that session. Um, the Shaw brothers, go for the Shaw brothers for me. Well, there was Paul and there was Michael. Um, their dad was the club doctor for a period of time. So uh, and he was a famous Hawthorne doctor, um, uh, Doctor Shaw. Um, Paul Shaw was probably um, well. Put it this way: we would not Richard Mackay that we'd kick the ball out, right? And this is how subtle we were. He would just always kick it to Paul Shaw, right? No matter for two years, the ball would just go to Paul Shaw. So wherever Paul Shaw was, with the ball was coming. So Paul Shaw was probably Chris Mew like, right? But he had a bit of a nasty streak, Paul, which I liked about him. So maybe a combination of Dylan Grimes and Chris Mew. Like they, they sort of combination, right? So just think it out. And as for Pinhead, Pinhead was – he was just a goal sneak. He was sort of the will-o'-the-wisp bloke who, you know, over the back of the pack, the ball would come through, fall in his hands, and he'd put it into the car park. He was probably more of a bit of goal, goal sneak. I'd say Timmy Hargraves. He was one of my favourite players at Hawthorne, right? You wouldn't notice him, and he'd just pop up and kick a couple. So they were both very, very good Q stalwarts, the Shaw boys. Yeah, good one, good one. Now you've, you've provided me a list of about twenty blokes here, so I reckon we'll I'll just I'll pick some out on the way through as we go. Uh, Marty Varner, I always want to hear about Marty Varner, the Godfather. Set, can I say the c word? He set the culture, right? Mm-hmm. So he was he was he was the person who talk about you reckon I commentate on the ground. My God, this bloke would commentate seven twenty four, and he was he was the bloke. So I think he organised the the Def Leppard and the uh, the Motley Crew and the Janie's got a gun before the game at halftime, right? So that's why that's why the crowds flocked because we were edit- we were in the entertainment business. We weren't in the sport business. We were in the entertainment business, right? And Marty recognised that. So he was probably Neil Barm without the aggression, um, and just standing in the forward pocket trying to hook blokes, right? The problem is the ball was never there. But he was a uh, he was a uh, very vocal and very strong culture leader at the club. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Chrissy Curtin, the, the, the record games holder from the from the era. Heart and soul. Um, he he used to tell me he was the complete footballer. Sorry, he is the complete footballer. But um, 
He had it all. He was uh, he commanded that Dougie Hawkins type wing at Q. Yeah. Uh, not the cemetery side. He used to stay on the other side, probably because he was a right footer all the time. He liked kicking downhill. He was probably more of an Andrew Gaff type accumulator. You know, when someone gets barreled on the ground and they stand up with the ball and you know they're dazed and stuff, he's like, quick, quick, quick one to me, quick one to me, all the time, right? That's how I think he accumulated so many stats, Chris Curtin. But he, uh, I don't know how many games. He played 200 games. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, okay, that's a, that's an illustrious record. So I would say he was a, a Cade Simpson, because I know he's a blues man, or Andrew Gaff-like person. There you go. There you go. You understanding uh, the analogies of bringing the AFL players in? I love, it, I love it. I love it. It's a bit of a pop culture sort of historical sort of pop culture sort of... Um, Just so the thousands and thousands of people that are watching this for the next couple of years can get some sort of understanding. Yeah, and that's good because I reckon, because part of this series is about the, the current blokes getting a feel for what was there. Now, what I'm encouraging the young blokes to do is just get your little Google open on the side screen here, just to keep up to date with who's around and what, what, what's been talked about here, what Dolce is referencing. So, so you get a sense of what Ali Fowler looked like in the day. Oh, fantastic. Like, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, but look at Ali Fowler in about... 1989, not Ali yeah. Fowler in 2021, okay? Yeah. Exactly. And, and Toddy. And Toddy <laughs> yeah. probably looks the same, doesn't she, with a bit of help? Yeah, she's all right, yeah. Yeah, good one. Um, is there anyone else you want to talk about? Because you've given me a big list and I haven't covered everyone. You've got the Doyle brothers and... Doyle brothers, yeah. Doyle brothers were good. They were. They could play, yeah. right? So um, I played down at Old Zabs for a couple of years, as the records will show, right? And I reckon that Mark... Mark Doyle probably would have got in the senior team as well. He was a good player, right? So um, he was clever, good hands. You know, he'd often put them down the throat. I used to say to him, I said, if it's not laced up, I'm not touching it, right? But he yeah. was good. He was good. So Joel Selwood liked for him, whereas Kev Doyle was a – I've got to say the right thing about Kev Doyle because he's, he's a, a well-known QC at the moment. You never know when you need him, right? Yeah, but no. uh, he was solid too and tough. Like he was one of those blokes – you know when you see the Lake Oval, games from the Lake Oval in like the yeah. 1970s and people are getting whacked and bashed and it's a mud bath? That's when Kev would dominate. He'd dominate. So he was probably, I don't know if the age group of the, or the demographics of people, the three people that are listening to this, but he was like a Des Tudnam. He was just wow. tough. Yeah. Good skills and just kept going in for the ball. And like Mark and Kev, they'd have an honest drink. Good skills. Head over the ball and uh, non-compromising, but very good. And always play good in big games. That's what Kev told me, at least. Always played well in big games. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Um, good one. So so going through all that, that's fantastic. So tell me about the, when you talk about your Club 18 time, what's the thoughts and feelings that come to you? What 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 did you love about it? Um, look, I just think it was just good mates and a lot of fun, right? We didn't take it seriously. And we had some blokes who couldn't play, and some blokes who really could. And as I as I said at the on today, you know, like I just didn't want to train and I was doing different things in my life and, you know, that sort of stuff. So I just wanted to come down and have a lot of fun and muck around, right? So, like, we had, before the game, like, normally I'd rock in two minutes before the game and be ready to play and run out, right? Sometimes I wouldn't even go in the change room, but I'd just stand in the goal square, right? But you'd want to get in the change room beforehand because we were talking about our social successes from the night before or what time we got home, you know, and the music we had playing. And, and I think I think in those couple of years, we just changed the face of, of, of the croc type, you know, Club 18 stuff, right? Yeah. And it became, rather than people go to the VFL or AFL or whatever it was back then, they'd come down and they'd watch the clubbers play, right? Yeah. And they knew. And, and the Q senior team probably got a bit peeved because there was probably half a dozen blokes that might have made that Q senior team at the time, right? They were good players. And um, so I think there's a lot of fun and camaraderie and, um, you know, and like Paul Cora, who obviously RIP from uh, a couple of months ago, like he was a good player, good muck around. He was just, whether you could play or not, it didn't matter, right? He was just a fun loving bloke. And, um, and it was good to see a lot of people at his sort of funeral and wake were just Q club guys, right? Who, even though it's 30 years later, we're still good mates and muck around. So the stories and the tales get a little bit bigger, right? But um, certainly not here, at least. No, but no, certainly in some of them, the stories and tales get bigger, but good, fun times. And I think we changed the culture of the Club 18. I think we really did in those couple of years. Well, as you reference, it was about entertainment more than sport. He understood the, understood the underlying principle. 
Yeah, and you know what? So the, the, the guys, some, some of the guys were studying and are working and stuff like that. They wanted to have a fun with some mates and just a bit of a kick, etc. You know, and they all did that pretty well. And we rotated the team, or I think most of the team rotated. I'm not too sure that I rotated too much, but most of them rotated. And uh, I never knew what the word rotation was, but um, but everyone had fun, good kick. It was really, really a good fun time, and we were successful as well, right? Yeah. So I think if you're in a team where you're getting flogged all the time, there was no camaraderie. That'd be terrible, right? But but we were the opposite of that. We had a lot of fun and a lot of success, and we were we were we were pretty decent blokes, I think, on and off the field. Yeah, yeah. So premiership year one for you as well. So that would have been a good start to the mix. Was um, I think that was the reference of the triple team factor that we mentioned before that became a myth in the VAFA. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's really funny because I, in that grand final, I reckon I didn't. I don't know. You'd have to look at the record. I don't reckon I had a sniff, right? I reckon I was a decoy. Because it was like half the bloody half the team was on me, so I think Nick might have kicked a couple, and Dave might have kicked a couple, and Rob McIsaac kicked a few. In the end, they were just all waltzing in for goals. My, 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 I was bloody getting belted on the side. So I'm not too sure if Toddy or Ali was there as well, but um, I think the I think we played Bloods in the grand final. I'm not too sure, but it was uh, playing at Alstonwick and playing at Kew was very different, right? Yeah. So the grounds were very different. So uh, and the wind was difficult as well. So. We used to spend a lot of time on the Friday afternoon just checking out the, the winds and all that stuff and flags and, you know, yeah. Matthew Lloyd started doing what I did 20 years earlier by throwing the grass. Yeah. You know what I mean? But you've got to be able to be a bit of science to the game and that's what I thought I did. Yeah, I think I heard a podcast. He referenced you, actually, Matthew Lloyd, so I think he appreciates it. I told it. him not to say anything, but if it's out in the open now, well, <laughs> what can you say? Um, so going through your career, what would you do the same, Dalton? and what would you do different? Um... I don't know, maybe uh, if I looked at the total career, maybe I would have trained a bit harder when I was a bit younger and you never know what would have happened. But, um, and I, and we've only, I only played the two games, two years at Q, right? And then we went down to, um, I went back to Old Zabs in their Club 18 and they had a good team as well. And, uh, and I think we won three down there or something similar, right? So it might have been, I don't know, might have been to stay at Q for another year or if we'd won another flag, I'm not too sure. But... Um, so, like anything, you want to be able to go, and hindsight's a wonderful thing, where, where did you have the most fun, mm. right? And um, if you played in a good spirit, um, may, maybe an extra year or two might have been good. Or I know Mick was trying to coach me to come down uh, at the end of my uh, Club 18 days at Old Zads. I was probably about 27, 28, or so, 29 back then. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. You know, when you get injuries at 29, 30, they're not paying you the, you know, the couple of grand a game that I got with Club 18 back in the 89s and 90s, yeah, yeah. right? You've got to think, is the juice worth the squeeze? So, yeah. so at the time, I probably retired too early. Did you? What? So retired what, at that age? Did you? Probably 29, 30, something like that. Yep. Do is most of the guys these days are actually starting in their 30s. That's when they're debuting. Tell me about it. Tell yeah, me about it. My oldest, my oldest brother played his first game for the club. He's at 37. That's incredible. 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 He's and did he play just the one game? Just the one game. Just the one game. Andrew McIsaac like, right? Yeah. That's right. Could have had anything. Yeah. yeah he was the best brother, like Andrew McIsaac. Um, so that's good. So what else have we missed, Matt, on the way through? So any other stories we haven't covered or any other questions I've missed? Look, I told you about the atmosphere of the games, what we try to do to bring entertainment to the – to the teams, the crowds were flocking and stuff. The guys that we played with were really good. Some were uh, over their depth, some were uh, under their depth, right? But we had good times, successful fun. Um, if I had the time again, as I said to you last time, it probably wouldn't change much at all. And uh, it was just a really good, fond memories of two good, fun years at Club 18. And if anyone's thinking of should I play or shouldn't I play and stuff, maybe I could have played a couple of years later, right? Now at 50. I don't reckon I'd get much. Oh, I reckon I'd be all right in the forward pocket, maybe. But um, play those extra couple of years because you're a long time retired, right? So, but the memories stay on. And um, and I think some people have got some tapes of some of the games, I think, also from years ago. So it'd be good to reminisce on those. And I think I think uh, Mick and I try to get everyone together on round one in the AFL down at the Skinny Dog every year, which should be a bit of fun, right? So um, if everyone can remember that, to come down first Friday night, whatever it is, Yep. We can all get together and tell a few lies and stories. And, um, no, it was very fond memories of my time down at Q. Yeah, absolutely. So that was a good night. We, we did that this year, didn't we? I think we might have been Collingwood Bulldogs or something that first Yeah, we, I think we tried Still it last playing. year and this year. COVID will try to interrupt it. But yeah. uh, I think if people get down there, it's really good fun. 
Yeah, current players, past players, anyone who's been involved in the club ever. That's yeah. a good night to get to. That's we all get down and, as Dolph said, tell a few lies. Similarly, on July 3, we've got uh, a past players day coming up this year as well, which we're all going to get together and watch yeah. the current players play. Yep. So, is yeah. Is that but, honorary or, or, or is it payment to, for people to, to go, Anth? Well, we've got to pay you to be there or is it, we'll, 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 we'll talk be paying. Later. Is this off? We'll, we'll, is it, are we still on interview now or is this off? No, we're still we clear. We can talk we'll, later. We'll, Oh, we'll talk later. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. So we'll, we'll get a collection and get you down there. So that's okay. We'll, we'll take Thanks, Anth. We just, but we asked for one hanger on someone's head at some point. Oh, a hover. <laughs> I think you said hover, right? Hover. That's right. Hover. So during the game as well, make sure. And it can be while they're playing, you can just jump on someone and. And know, it'd be great to get the Shantuzis down there playing at the same time, right? It could be a fun afternoon. You'd want to be up, wouldn't you? you that's <laughs> right. So, I like uh, it. That's good as gold. That's good as gold, Dulce. Dulce, thanks very much for doing this today. I mean, you brought a lot of life and excitement and uh, perhaps a bit of confidence to the to the series and I love it but that's what we love this is what it's all about this series bringing bringing the the past to life and with a bit of color and energy I've uh, been a pleasure to have you on today and answer some of your questions tough questions you're Mike Munro of a current affair you really go hard didn't you right so lucky you didn't give me any Dorothy Dixes that would have been into a bit of trouble right but thanks for your time I hope you didn't fall asleep when I was having a bit of a chat but, no, uh, not at all, mate. I'm up and about. Up and about. Thanks, Anthony. It was good. And yeah. uh, and um, credit clip to you. Well done for doing this series, right? We've got Coras that will be in Memorial. We can watch it any time. And the other ones that you've done, uh, they're really good fun for us to have a listen. How many people normally sort of click into them? Are there thousands and stuff? Well, so we we gen- if you get about a hundred, you've done pretty well. I'm expecting thousands for yours. Um, but, I'll just get uh, my kids to clip in 50, 40, 50 times each and my wife and stuff. We'll get at least 150. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And have you got a bit of a profile? I've looked up, looked you up online. It said actor underneath your name as well. So that's... Well, that was that was under VAFA, right, at the time, right, when in the back of <laughs> it, hold, holding me, holding me, that sort of stuff, right? So it's crucified me. Yeah, absolutely, in time. But anyway, that's good as gold, mate, and that's a pleasure to have you on because it's up and about, and that's what the series is all about, as I mentioned. So thanks again for what you've done today. Thanks, Anthony, and everyone out there in cyberspace. See ya. Good day, mate. Signing off this week, team. Um, thanks, Dolce. It's been superb to have you on. And remember, team, we are the Mighty Club 18.